Welcome back to the world of Eichard, where we learn how to think like the College Board. We are finishing up Unit 4 today with topics 4.6 and 4.7. Then let's lasso up that knowledge right quick. You only need to know two things in 4.6. One, state expansion and centralization led to resistance from an array of social, political, and economic groups on a local level. And two, slave resistance challenged existing authorities in the Americas. After that, it's just illustrative examples. And keep in mind that these are resistance movements to both Unit 3 land-based empires and Unit 4 maritime empires. Let's start with the Pueblo Revolt over in North America. This can be seen as resistance to state expansion, specifically the expansion of the Spanish Empire. The Pueblo are an indigenous civilization in present-day New Mexico, which at the time was in the far north of Spanish control in the Americas. Spanish conquistadors attempted to establish political domination, the encomienda labor system, and forced conversion to Christianity. Many did convert, but there always remained a strong persistence of Pueblo beliefs. In the 17th century, the Spanish attempted to eradicate these indigenous beliefs and were even less tolerant than they were before. They destroyed kivas, Pueblo ceremonial structures, as well as religious icons and forced the people to build more churches. These events were the trigger that caused the major revolt in 1680. But there were many Pueblo grievances. For example, resentment towards the encomienda system. There were also poor harvests and food shortages. The Pueblo revolt of 1680 was most notable because of how widespread and well-coordinated it was. It was largely led by spiritual and religious leaders, most famously Pope Hay. They planned it beforehand, communicating with each other secretly and agreeing to strike at the same time in multiple villages. The result was that the Spanish were expelled and the Pueblo Pueblo gained their independence. Eventually, the Pueblo were reconquered by the Spanish, but the Spanish realized they would have to be more tolerant of indigenous religion, so the persecution was substantially less than it had been before the revolt. While we're still in North America, let's head just a little bit north and talk about Medicom's War, another war by indigenous Americans against European expansion. By the 1670s, there were about 65,000 English settlers in the territories of New England, which had caused the displacement and at times genocide of many of the native inhabitants, although trade relations and diplomacy were also present. But diplomacy failed seriously in 1675 when leaders of the Plymouth Colony executed three members of the Wampanoag tribe of southern Massachusetts for the murder of another Wampanoag who was friendly with the English. The Wampanoag, who already had plenty of reasons to be upset with the English, saw this as a violation of their sovereignty. Led by a chief named Medicom, aka King Philip, they launched what became the most devastating conflict in New England's colonial history. Medicom was a capable military leader as well as a skilled diplomat, and he was able to form a coalition of many tribes in addition to the Wampanoag. Half of all the English settlements were attacked and thousands died on each side. The English were eventually victorious, not least because they also had support from other Native American tribes. But colonial England's economy and society took decades to recover from this conflict. This was one of many of the rationales for the colonists to further displace the Wampanoag and their allies, part of a long-standing pattern of Western expansion at the expense of indigenous peoples. Now let's talk about the Fronde in France between 1648 and 1653. This was more of a resistance against state centralization, which occurred during the reign of King Louis XIV. Uh, Mr. Eichard, wasn't Louis XIV only like nine years old at the time? That is correct, yes. I also don't take kindly to absolutist nine-year-old kids. Well, most of the resentment was actually directed at Cardinal Mazarin, the chief minister. He and his predecessor, Cardinal Richelieu, had done a lot of work to make the French monarchy more powerful. Richelieu had established the networks of intendants. We talked about them in Unit 3. He also greatly increased taxation to fund wars. This was all resented by the nobility, who of course didn't like taxes, but also could see that their traditional powers and privileges were being reduced, while the monarchy was getting more powerful. His successor, Cardinal Mazarin, continued and expanded these policies, and he also had a reputation for financial mismanagement. He kept spending more money than the crown could afford, and so he needed to keep raising taxes further. The first serious opposition came from the Parlement of Paris, a judicial court that resented the fact that the royal government was instating new taxes without their approval. Then they were supported by many members of the nobility, who saw this as an opportunity to gain back some of their eroding power. There was also support from the bourgeoisie, the growing urban middle class that were also being hurt by taxes on business and trade. It was further joined by the urban poor, who were suffering from the economic crisis caused by the general chaos of the time, as well as by dwindling food supplies because of poor harvests. The 1600s were a pretty bad time as far as climate goes. So every social class was against the king? 
For a time, it seemed that way, but the nobility ended up breaking into factions and fighting each other. Then both the Spanish and English invaded for a while. Eventually, the people were sick of all the fighting and foreign invasions, and they were also disgusted with the nobility who were clearly just trying to increase their own power. So they looked to King Louis, now a teenager, as a stabilizing force. Absolute monarchy started to seem like a good idea. So Louis XIV learned the lesson that you need to keep a close eye on the nobility, which is exactly why he moved the royal capital to Versailles and forced noble families to stay there with him. While we're still in Europe, let's head east a little bit and talk about the Cossacks. The Cossacks were specialists when it came to resisting authority. They were an eclectic mix of Turkic migrants from the steppes, runaway Russian serfs, and an assortment of other adventurous types. They were known for their excellent horsemanship and military capabilities, as well as their love of freedom and ferocity in defending that freedom. They settled in the area roughly equivalent to present-day Ukraine. There were a series of Cossack revolts, but let's just focus on two and start with the Khmelnytsky uprising of 1648. This was against a state called the Commonwealth of Poland-Lithuania. The Polish nobility had been disrespecting the Cossacks who lived on their eastern border. Among other things, such as land disputes, they were religiously intolerant. The Polish were Catholic while the Cossacks were largely Eastern Orthodox Christians. Led by a hetman named Bodan Khmelnytsky, the Cossacks were able to inflict some serious damage on the Polish slash Lithuanians, partially with help from outside powers like Russia. Eventually, this led to the creation of a semi-independent state called the Cossack Hetmanate a vassal of the Russian Empire. But then by the 1660s, there was another major Cossack revolt, this time against the Russian Empire itself. The Russian czars of the relatively new Romanov dynasty had been busy expanding and centralizing their power, including increases in taxation and forced military conscription on the peasants and the serfs. In addition, there was a lot of resentment towards the boyars, the nobility, who often mistreated the serfs. Many of these serfs escaped and ran away to join the Cossacks. When the Russian government demanded that the Cossacks return these serfs back to their masters, they refused, and the government pronounced the Cossacks as criminals and cut off their food supply. In response, the Cossacks organized a resistance army, led by Stenka Razin, an adventurer who built his reputation through successful raiding and pillaging. Razin and his Cossacks were also joined by many of the disgruntled peasants and serfs in the Russian Empire. His ragtag army of Cossacks and peasants had some military successes early on, but they were eventually defeated, and Razin was executed in 1671. Now let's head over to Africa and talk about Queen Njinga. Njinga was a formidable and resourceful ruler who ruled two different kingdoms, Ndongo and Matamba, in her lifetime. She was a member of the Ndongo royal family and acted as a diplomat on behalf of her brother the king, attempting to negotiate with the Portuguese to respect the sovereignty of Ndongo. In order to improve diplomacy, she converted to Catholicism and took the Christian name Anna. Her diplomatic skills and royal bearing impressed the Portuguese, but they later reneged on their deal and kept expanding farther inland and conducting slave raids. She eventually became the queen of Ndongo and at times negotiated with and fought with the Portuguese, who refused to recognize her rule and instead supported a series of puppet kings. Just when it looked like she was powerless, she fled inland and allied with a tribe of fierce warriors, the Imbangala. She combined her more refined regal style with their warlike powers and established a new dynasty at Matamba, which grew to be a serious power in the region. To expand support, she granted freedom to escaped slaves and runaways from the Portuguese colony of Angola. As she expanded Matamba, she also developed diplomatic ties with the Kingdom of Congo and also with the Dutch. By consolidating her power in Matamba and allying with the rising power of the Dutch, she was able to limit the expansion of Portuguese Angola. Now let's talk about the second part of resistance in Topic 4.6, slave resistance. There were many instances of enslaved people who resisted their oppression. For example, there was the Stono Rebellion in 1739 in British South Carolina, which specialized in rice cultivation, a major cash crop originally brought to the Americas by enslaved Africans. We talked about all this in our video about the Columbian Exchange. In addition to the general human urge to be free, there were a few possible triggers for why the Stona Rebellion occurred when it did. One reason was that the Spanish had promised freedom to escape slaves in their colony of Florida. Not because the Spanish loved freedom, they also had slaves, but because they wanted their rivals, the British, to experience chaos in their colonies. Another reason was because the colonial government in South Carolina had announced the Security Act, which required all white men to carry firearms. At this time, white colonists were far outnumbered by slaves, and the colonists needed to arm themselves to enforce a racial hierarchy that kept themselves at the top. Many of the enslaved people in South Carolina had heard about these developments and decided it was time to act. Led by an Angolan man named Jemmy, they seized muskets from a store near Stono Bridge. About a hundred of them marched south, carrying banners that said liberty, but eventually the militia crushed the rebellion. This resulted in South Carolina quickly passing the Negro Act, which prohibited slaves from growing their own food, assembling in groups, or learning to write in English. It also made it legal for slave owners to kill rebellious slaves. 
More large-scale examples of slave resistance occurred in Jamaica with the establishment of maroon communities. Jamaica had originally been a Spanish colony specializing in the cultivation of sugar, the ultimate cash crop. The word maroon comes from the Spanish cimarron and was the term used to describe runaway slaves. Many of these runaways fled to the interior of Jamaica in places like the Blue Mountains, which were difficult to get to for sea-based empires like Spain and later England. These maroons allied with the indigenous Taino people and set up autonomous, independent communities and future generations of runaway slaves continued to join these communities. When the English invaded in 1655, many of the slaves fled the Spanish plantations, greatly increasing the numbers and power of the Maroons. The English would eventually try to subjugate the Maroons during the Maroon Wars, but they failed. These West Africans were highly capable at surviving in tropical climates, and many of them were very skilled warriors who excelled at guerrilla tactics. Many of the slaves had originally come from the area in and around the Asante Empire. We also talked about them in 4.4. Under the leadership of Captain Cujo, Captain Quao, and most famously Queen Nanny, the Maroons were able to resist the English and their independence was formally recognized in 1740, making the Maroons the oldest independent black community in Jamaica, and they're still there today. Much of their culture, including linguistic elements, can be connected to Asante origins. Now let's move on to topic 4.7, changing social hierarchies. This first section is about how many states, particularly the Mughals and the Ottomans, made use of the diversity of their empires, while other states attempted to suppress press diversity. Let's talk about the Mughals and the Ottomans. The Mughals were the most tolerant of diversity, especially because of the policies of Akbar. He famously removed the jizya tax on non-Muslims and instituted the policy of Suli Kul, universal tolerance. Mansabdars were military commanders in charge of a certain number of soldiers in a certain territory. Religion was not a limiting factor for who could be a Mansabdar. It was based upon loyalty and merit. Similarly, the Zamindars, bureaucratic elites who collected taxes, could be Muslim, Hindu, or other. Politically, Akbar and his successors also made use of the Hindu monarchs, such as those of the Rajput kingdoms. Rather than attempting to conquer them all, they actually forged marriage alliances. Jahangir, the fourth Mughal emperor, was the son of Akbar and a Hindu Rajput princess, and Jahangir himself also married some Hindu princesses. These alliances meant that the Hindu kingdoms retained control over their territories in exchange for pledging loyalty and military support to the Mughal empire. We already discussed in Unit 3 how the Ottomans made use of the Devshirma system, which utilized Christian slave boys and trained them as military elites, the Janissaries, and political elites that often rose to the rank of vizier. This is definitely an example of how states utilize the economic, political, and military contributions of ethnic groups. Another example of the Ottomans' accommodation of diversity in its empire was the millet system, which recognized different religious communities, such as those of Jews and Christians, as separate legal entities. These communities could pass their own laws and regulate their own societies. Christians and Jews could also work as tax farmers, allowing them to gain considerable economic power. Like in the Mughal Empire, the Ottomans were often more concerned about merit and loyalty to the state than religious conformity. But unlike in the Mughal Empire under Akbar, these religious minorities still had to pay the jizya tax. On the other end of the spectrum, in terms of tolerance of diversity, we can look at the Spanish Empire, especially under the leadership of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. In 1492, the same year they sent off Columbus on his famous voyage, the Spanish completed the Reconquista, the Christian reconquest of Spain that in Muslim rule. They then passed the Edict of Expulsion, which gave the Jews in Spain the choice between converting to Christianity or leaving. Many of the Jews did leave and ended up settling in the Ottoman Empire, who they knew were much more tolerant. This section is about the rise of new political and economic elites that arose in 1450 to 1750 because of imperial expansion and economic opportunities. Two examples are required knowledge. Let's start with the transition to the Qing Dynasty in China. The ethnic Manchu who conquered China naturally occupied a new elite, particularly particularly the members of the Eight Banners. These military leaders were also often granted significant amounts of land and were exempted from certain taxes. But the Qing Dynasty also maintained the civil service exam, and the Han scholar elites remained important in the government's administration. And many lesser Han officials who had supported the Manchus' conquest rose to higher positions as a result, making them also new elites who benefited from the Qing transition. However, the Han majority were often excluded from the highest positions in government, as well as in the military. The second required piece of content here is the Costa system, which was a social hierarchy entirely based on race that developed in Spain's empire in the Americas. At the top were the Peninsulares, Europeans from Spain, followed by the Criollos, people of European origin who were born in the Americas. Then there was a variety of mixed races, followed by indigenous Americans, and finally enslaved Africans at the bottom. In reality, it was a bit more complex, since there was a wide range of racial mixing, but people could often officially change their racial status by social and economic advancement. To be sure, the Peninsulares were 
decidedly at the top. And a race-based hierarchy was not unique to the Spanish colonies. It was everywhere in the Americas. In all examples, the white Europeans placed themselves at the top. Finally, we need to talk about the fate of traditional elites whose power fluctuated in this time period. We already mentioned the European nobility and the boyars in this video and in the Unit 3 review. Let's finish up by talking about the Ottoman Sepahi. These were the expert cavalry units that had been the traditional military elites in the early days of the empire. They were granted large fiefs of land called timars, and they kept the income from these lands in exchange for military service. But as gunpowder became more important, the traditional importance of cavalry decreased. And as the Ottomans expanded into Europe, they had more access to Christian slaves. As the importance and power of the Janissaries increased, the importance of the Sepahi decreased. Reducing the power of the Sepahi and reducing their timars was another way for the Ottoman sultans to centralize their power. So that's it for the required content of 4.6 and 4.7. That's enough for today. Thanks for watching World of Ikerd, and we'll see you again in Unit 5.